Yeah, Opto Electronics. Yeah. Uh, so, so change the first one. So this is me. Um, quick uh, rundown on some of the stuff that I've done in the past. Uh, my current profession is in uh, automation work for uh, large data centers. Uh, the stuff that I've been talking about today is more related to my hobby stuff. Uh, I'm one of the hackers at NYC Resistor in New York, a hackerspace. And I'm also one of the co-founders of the Make NYC group, a uh, group of guys who are inspired by Make Magazine to go out and do random, crazy DIY events involving everyone we can invite to show up. Um, several of my projects have been somewhat famous or infamous. But uh, not too many on the actual uh, light side of things. A lot of them are mostly related to case mods. Um, I like to say I am a failure, because I am. I am a massive, massive failure. Most of my best projects have been horrendous failures. OK, I have a microphone. Do I really need to? OK. Enunciate. OK. OK. So. I started Make NYC in 2007. It was kind of the first thing that I did. Um, the basic idea there was me and a couple of guys were sitting around and we decided that we love doing DIY stuff, so we built a whole community building DIY stuff in New York. Next thing I know, I made a member at NYC Resistor and I get to do this inside of a more established uh, group of people with physical location. Um, like most technology people, I'm drawn to lights. Uh, small animals are drawn to lights. Most people love lights. Uh, the first projects that most people do in electronics are making lights blink. In fact, the demo for the Arduino is the blink application. It may as well be Hello World. Um, featured here is uh, a device called a Stribe, which uh, uses touch sensitive strips with uh, LED bar graphs to uh, operate as a musical instrument with sound max. So we're going to move on. The question is, what is an optoelectronic? And the optoelectronic is basically like this stuff here, it's a light. Um, it's an electronic device that generates light. Pretty simple. There's a lot of different devices that can do this. I'll go through some of the more basic ones and discuss some of how these devices operate. Having a, uh, an understanding of how they operate and why they operate gives you the opportunity to do cool things with them that maybe people haven't thought of doing before. All right. So electromagnetism is one of the few fundamental forces that we understand. Uh, these are the Maxwell equations. They are basically the definition of how we understand electromagnetism to operate on a physical level. Light can be measured as an electromagnetic wave and is fairly frequently. Uh, most of our understanding of it comes from there. Uh, this is way better than E equals MC squared in my opinion. It's, we base so much on these principles and they are absolutely correct every time. Next one. Light. Light sets a universal bar for speed. As far as we know, there is no way to change the speed of light, although there have been some lab tests where that may be possible. Uh, it defines color. Um, what we perceive to be color is actually us just seeing light on the electromagnetic wave spectrum. That's that layer right there, the visible light. Um, frequency length of the waves actually dictates whether or not it has a different color in terms of our perception. The CIE standard of 1931 is a standard that was designed to uh, let everyone know what red was, or blue was, or green was. They went out to a lot of different people in different countries, got an idea of what people perceived as red, what people perceived as green, yellow, and generated a standard by which we could define colors to be red, green, blue. Later on, CIE was used by uh, a couple of different groups, the most recently is the ICC group for standardizing RGB, and uh, most of our digital screens here rely on it for telling us whether red is red or blue is blue. Shoot. That's actually an interesting question. It's kind of a problem with CIE 1931. There's been some discussion about that. This was done a long time ago, at least a full generation ago, a generation that's gone and died and had generation after generation, literally after generation of people that have been progressing in evolution and changing slightly. The, uh, there is a concern that it's possible that we don't all perceive red anymore as we did in 1931. These tests might have to be redone. They might have to go out and sample the population again and come up with what we consider to be red is still red or blue, is still blue. And yes, there's the regional approach as well. We are 
different people. We come from different areas. We're affected by our environment as much as we are by our genetic heritage and a lot of other things. And different people with specific illnesses or dis, dis, uh, disparaments or their, uh, yeah, disimpairments. Yeah, they, uh, they might view light differently. Okay, so this is a how do you get started into the electronic stuff before we get going on anything else. Um, it's important that uh, people ask these questions every time they start getting into this stuff. So these are pretty, pretty standard questions. You know, how do I get started? What do I need? Where do I get things? Where do I go get help? I'm doing this just because if anyone's never worked with electronics before, I can answer a couple of these pretty quickly. Um, on the left are a whole bunch of really good phrases that people use to define, I'm just gonna go do this now and I don't care whether I screw up. And on the right are some good ideas, which is start small, start with kits, listen to advice, but treat them like Amazon reviews. Um, people will tell you things like, that's a bad idea, you shouldn't do that. Sometimes they're right. If a lot of people tell you that's a bad idea, you shouldn't do that, odds are they, they all have a good idea. Um, some of them say, that's a bad idea, I wouldn't do that, but some of them say, no, that's a great idea, you should do it, you know, you got a 50-50 there. It's, it's just like Amazon reviews. There's always gonna be someone who hates it, there's always gonna be someone who likes it, but if you see some sort of mainline group of people saying that there's a problem doing this, odds are there is. Uh, Three Wolf Moon is the greatest hacking t-shirt of all time. From what I understand, they uh, just did like a boron carbide thing where they can turn t-shirts into like bulletproof stuff. And uh, the running joke now is, is that's Four Wolf Moon. Um, also kind of a pun on the Amazon reviews. Don't be afraid to fail. As I said earlier, failure is a wonderful thing. If you blow up your project, it is enjoyable. You will destroy LEDs, you will destroy light bulbs, you will destroy vacuum tubes and a million other things. That's okay, and sometimes it is a lot of fun to watch it happen. Don't get too put out if you destroy a kit that's worth $100,000. It happens. <laughs> uh, so, People always ask what, what are the things you might need to start. These are the simple ones, soldering iron, multimeter, wire strippers, and snips. Those are my personal opinion ones. Everyone's got a different opinion. That's the stuff that I would start with and everything beyond that you can borrow or beg, borrow, steal, whatever. Uh, where do I get stuff? This is kind of like my sourcing list. These are the immediate ones. Adafruit's great for kits, so is Maker Shed. Both have kits. eBay is a wonderful, wonderful thing for component searching. It's better than any mail order catalog you can get because it actually shows you the components. Sometimes it will even have data sheets for things that no longer exist in most component books. Very, very great place. Sure Electronics is a personal favorite. They're a Hong Kong vendor. They do a lot of uh, optoelectronic stuff. Very cheap. Uh, Mighty Ohm is compiling a list of surplus and electronic stores throughout the country on his wiki. Uh, there is a lot of information there. If your city is listed, you might know where there's electronic stores now to buy things that may otherwise be difficult to find. Um, that's a good one. Uh, if you find something missing from there, add it. All Electronics is another surplus vendor, uh, like MPJ or a couple of others. And these are the, uh, the major mail order locations that people know about. Mauser, Digikey, Jameco. McMaster does a lot of bolts and metal device, um, a lot of construction devices, gearing, things of that nature. Basically anything you can think of, McMaster Catalog has in it, and is a wonderful, wonderful thing. Uline has a lot of packaging, tape. Uh, I go there for double-sided tape, things of that nature, weird 3M stuff that might be difficult to get otherwise. Getting in-person help, hacker spaces are the place to go. The microcontroller study group that Resistor set up many, many years ago has morphed into a group of people, like seven or 800 people on that list who are all very intelligent people and willing to help if you tell them what you're doing, what you have a question about, they will almost respond instantaneously. Uh, make groups, uh, dork bots, and burners are great people to talk to about engineering ideas. Although, take it with a grain of salt, they, uh, the burners are, they prescribe to what's called ganjo, ganzo engineering, which kind of means that sometimes it's maybe not the safest idea. Bird. Yeah. Bird yeah, that's, that's what I'm saying. Uh, okay, so lights. There's a, there's a number of different lights. I'm not gonna be able to discuss all of them. There are a lot. Uh, this is mostly about optoelectronics, so I'm not gonna get into anything that involves, you know, like 
gerbil genetics, which apparently is being used currently. Uh, so let's get going. The LED, the one that everyone knows, um, it, is, it is the quintessential light-up device. So light-emitting diode, it is a diode. Uh, the material used inside the diode uh, generates, well, it, it helps figure out what color you're going to get. So here's how. You, for light, if you have an atom, it has electrons spinning around it. And electrons move from energy state to energy state. As they jump out to the higher energy states, or they get energy. This usually happens via conduction or something of that nature that pushes them into that other energy state. When they drop down into a lower energy state, they have to get rid of the energy they previously had, and that's when they emit a photon. And the photon is perceived as light. The distance it drops from the outer energy state to the lower energy state is, defines the frequency of the light that you perceive. So basically, with most diodes, um, they're mostly red, actually. Uh, most diodes that are non-visible diodes are non-visible because they're actually emitting photons in the infrared range, or they're shielded, so you can't see them. Which is why the first LEDs that we were developing were ambers and reds that were coming from the red range. It was the same materials. We started using different materials and mixes of materials and treating them differently, and we started to push them up into greater ranges where you started to see brighter colors up into the ultraviolet ranges, and we have the many various different LEDs we have today made of multiple materials now. Um, where are LEDs used? Everywhere. They, uh, they exist in pretty much every component on the planet. They are cheap, cheap beyond cheap, and they can indicate to anyone anything. It's the ultimate binary bit that we all know. Red is on, we know it's on. Red is bad, green is good. Blue is really bright. Sometimes it hurts your eyes. Uh, that's actually an interesting point, by the way. With LEDs, there's different types of LEDs. And this is true of lasers as well, and you have to be very careful when dealing with components from China about this. Sometimes they will sell you things like a red laser that is not that powerful red laser, but is very powerful infrared laser, and it will burn your eyes out without you realizing it. Um, this is true of LEDs as well. If you're working with very powerful infrared LEDs that your eyes cannot perceive, they can hurt you and you cannot realize it until it's done a lot of damage to you. Shoot. Anything that, yeah, anything that's outside the range of human perception, we won't see, but it's still hitting us. It's still light, it's still bombarding our eyes, it can still do a great deal of damage. Yeah, and in fact, some people rely on that. Um, UV treating devices, a friend of ours was getting ultraviolet LEDs that he knew specifically were high in the UV range, higher than they should be. And uh, he was using that to treat boards that he was uh, using ferrochloride on. How do you try to test it? You, you kind of, most people can't, yeah. Uh, Yeah, actually, that's a, for infrareds, that's a good one. For ultraviolets, maybe not so much, but lots of older cameras. In fact, there's tricks for like subway cameras and security cameras where people will attach a super bright LED to their hat and walk around and you'll not be able to see them. Um, with a lot of older cameras, certainly most security cameras work with infrared because they want to be able to see in the dark. Um, you can see infrared through those. But a lot of cameras nowadays also have IR filters that they're adding more and more. This is like cell cameras and regular cameras are starting to see more IR filtration. But yeah, just something to be aware of. This stuff does operate in multiple, frequen uh, multiple frequency ranges and some of it can really hurt you. Uh, cost of semiconductor material has dropped, which means LEDs are incredibly cheap. They didn't used to be, which is why when they first came out, we weren't using them everywhere. Now they are cheap, now we're putting them everywhere. They're taking over everywhere. Next up. Where do you get LEDs? Basically, you don't buy them from Radio Shack. Uh, the reason is because is Radio Shack will charge you a small fortune. You want to buy them from China, because China will sell them to you in bulk very cheap. Uh, the places that I know that will sell you them best in bulk, in any type that you're looking for, is eBay. There are a bunch of these little tiny Hong Kong shops on eBay that will sell you bulk loads of whatever LEDs you're looking for. And they, they rock. 
MPJ is a local distributor in the Northeast that I use because they can deliver within a day as opposed to Hong Kong, which will deliver within several weeks and sometimes end up getting stuck in customs or something. Uh, LEDs does full, large batches. Uh, basically don't buy one LED, buy them by the hundreds. They, they are so cheap that it costs you next to nothing. You can spend $5 and get 100 LEDs. Shoot. Well, you know what, there, it's usually not that bad of a problem. It's only when you're looking at things that are very low. P problem is people, or very powerful LEDs. Regular LEDs can't really hurt you too much, so no matter whether or not they're in the infrared range or not, it doesn't matter. It's when you're working with higher power ones. There's different levels of power that come out of LEDs. Some people get very powerful LEDs for certain use cases, like uh, growing plants or something to that effect. Um, some people get them just because they like to see how, how bright they can get their LED to be. Maybe really cheap flashlight LEDs from China. Those, those are a concern, but not regular LEDs because they're generally low enough power. Shoot. Yep. Yeah, the, the, there are those one watt LEDs out there. You probably don't want those for most use cases, and they are a lot more expensive. They usually require heat sinks and all sorts of nastiness. But for the regular LED, you should be fine. The standard three millimeter, five millimeter LEDs you see will be, they're okay. Um, so using LEDs is very, very simple. Um, v equals I times R, very simple stuff. Uh, basically, you can either use an LED alone, you can use them in series, or you can put them into an array. There's multiple ways of doing arrays. You can do them manually with things like Charlie practicing, or you could get a driver. I suggest getting a driver. Having made arrays by hand, Driver chips are phenomenal, phenomenal things. They will save you a lot of time, and they are fairly cheap depending on what you're looking for out of them, especially once you want to do pulse width modulation and things like that. Um, all right. So the, the lone LED has been used very well with the graffiti research lab throw that everyone knows about. Um, a lot of people will tell you to put the voltage onto the long one and then the ground onto the short one which makes sense, except that some LEDs and LEDs that you've already snipped are now the same length. So when you look inside, you can actually see anode is little guy, cathode's a big guy, and you connect voltage to the little guy every time. So if you learn that, you'll always know how to wire up an LED. Pretty simple. Uh, okay. So arrays, I do suggest everyone build one once just to see how they work. Um, they, they're very, they're, they're, they're a real nightmare to build. They take a long time. And if you have, if it's your first soldering project and you've got something touching something else or not touching something else, it's really hard to debug it. You're sitting there with a multimeter tapping it constantly. But it does teach you a lot about how the arrays operate. Once you've done it once, I suggest you go out and you just buy the arrays from someone else because they are fairly cheap. This is one of the Sure Electronics arrays that I got. Uh, dual color 6432 guy, and it even had the built-in driver shift registers on the back. All you had to do was speak serial to it, and you could load up one row at a time and phase through. Basically, um, with something like this, with the on-chip array, what you're doing is, is you're populating one row at a time, moving it along, next row, move it along, and it'll refresh kind of like a, a CRT television. So one row will be active, or two rows might be active, and the rest will be off. But because of the way the eye perceives things, something like you can't see below, I believe it was like, considered to be 27.5 frames a second is the one that we use as a standard on television, um, you, you'll be fine as long as you keep this around 60 hertz. So you'll have one row lit constantly, and on this image you can kind of see where they're being lit. There's two separate sets of uh, rows because they're two separate uh, circuit sets behind here. But this row's lit, this row's lit. And you, the other ones seem dimmer because they're actually not lit. They're, they were lit a moment ago when the image started to be captured. If you get a camera fast enough, you can actually see this. It's sort of why when you point a camera at a CRT, you see refresh on it. Uh, if you also synchronize the refresh rates, you don't see it. It can disappear. It's kind of neat. Um, okay. Some of the older arrays and older chip drivers 
were parallel, which uh, means non-serial. Serial is feed them in one at a time, get it going. Parallel meant usually you'd have to feed in eight bits at one moment and then do your next, do it again. Pretty straightforward. Um, the arrays aren't always all in an array like this. Um, some of the older like VU meters and sliders were built like as arrays, but they were just one long line. So what they've basically done is, is they've taken the next line and attached it here and the next line attached it over here so that they can use the array technology for building a lot of different things. Most of the major bar graphs that you'll see are set up in similar fashion. It's, it's pretty cool. Okay, so this is a cool device. This is called the Nixie tube. Uh, the Nixie tube is uh, not a vacuum tube. A lot of people think it is. It's actually got gas in there. Uh, neon gas, argon, and I think mercury in it. And uh, it's called the Coda Kaplan tube. Uh, it works kind of like the famous Tesla neon gas tubes that everyone knows about. He used to have these orbs that he'd walk around with and they'd light up because he was playing with wireless power. And uh, we got into that. But basically, uh, well, do right now. So, Neon gas is kind of neat. Once you, when you excite it, uh, it basically the, there's a phosphorus light that's emitted from it, which you may even call it a phosphorescent gas. Uh, but it's not in this case. It, it's just basically excitation of the atoms. It's not kind of like when we get to VFDs, you'll see what a fluorescent phosphorus can generate. It's a different thing, but very similar. Uh, what they do here is in design, uh, you'll have your a conductor here and then a mesh around it and the mesh and the conductor act as cathode and anode and they get the gas excited only between the two components. So the gas is actually generating the glow, not the metal. So pretty straightforward, kind of uh, neat. Uh, they're great for, because they look very nice, but they require a heck of a lot of voltage at very low amperage, which is a problem. Uh, this stuff. Basically, the uh, fluorescent bulb got its name from George Stokes, who's an Irishman. Uh, Tesla did not invent it, but he w did make them fairly famous. And we use them nowadays in a number of different scenarios. Uh, yep. Okay. Purchasing Nixies, before I get to how to power them. Uh, buy them from shady Russian people. So the best place to get them. The Russians were using them for years. They still use them to a degree. But there's old new stock all over the internet. You can buy them by the box fulls of hundreds. Problem is, is they will probably come with data sheets like this, which means you know, you're know you going to want to look at the actual structure inside, pick out which pin is which number, which pin is the ground, which pin is so on. So pretty straightforward. You buy them on eBay, they're very cheap depending on the size. The bigger ones are very expensive now because they're kind of rare. Um, if you want to use Nixies, like I was saying earlier, they require a high voltage, which means you're going to need a boost converter to step the voltage up from a, usually a lower voltage source, like a battery or something. Since it's very low milliamperage, you don't really need a big power supply. Uh, what they usually use, the easiest uh, circuit is called a flyback converter. If you want to learn how power supplies work, this is one of the best power supplies you can get involved in teaches you about pretty much almost every single component and how they operate. That's why people considered Nixie clocks to be a great kit to be involved in developing as your like first EE project. Uh, if you're only going for the look, you maybe don't want to go into this. Question. Um, I do, but uh, it's useless to everyone but me. I bought the entire stock off of Mauser. <laughs> I assume so. Uh, the biggest problem there is I, I, I don't know off the top of my head. I do know that back then, though, that was TTL logic chips. So you'd be concerned about most of our digital chips nowadays are 3 volt chips on their digital. Uh, back in the day, they were 5 volt. So if you start dropping TTL logic chips into standard circuits today, you can have a lot of problems. You probably shouldn't do that. Um, I don't know off the top of my head to be honest, but there are driver chips out there. You don't really need them for the, for the Nixie tubes that much. Uh, if you run like Nixie bar graphs, you might actually want the driver for that because they are kind of a little difficult to control. Uh, I, actually, what's really... Uh, 
you're, yeah, you can, you need something to, you need something to shut off and give it power as needed on each of the ports. So, shoot. Frequency of what? Yeah. Uh, this is DC. I don't know what the frequency of the DC for signal is. I couldn't tell you off the top of my head. Um, but the lowest one's kind of neat. Uh, this is back to that whole Tesla thing. You can light up the gas by being in a electrified field. Uh, this works on Nixie tubes, as it does with uh, most uh, fluorescent light bulbs. There's uh, display stands like people going under high tension lines with fluorescent light bulbs and watching them light up. Anywhere that there's an open high tension line, there's electrified air. It works with uh, Nixies as well. We tested it on a power supply that was being used on a lifter, and we were lighting them up like a foot away from the thing, so. Yep, that's a 555. Um, it, you can look up any, just look up a flyback inverter. There's a million of them out there. The Minty Boost, uh, not the Minty Boost, the, uh, the Jewel Thief is a similar design. Um, that's actually very cool if you want to learn about how inductance operates. It's a very neat circuit. Uh, da -da -da -da. Okay. So the, the, these things are great, but they, to be perfectly honest, they are kind of difficult to use. For most people, you don't want to get into using them directly. Um, there's a better alternative, and that's the pneumatron. The pneumatron doesn't work in the same way. It works in the same way that a light bulb does. It's still a tube, which means you still get your tube awesomeness, and it still glows with a similar hue, but that's because it's actually heating copper and exciting electrons along the copper. Um, in this case, these are really cheap as well. Um, they're harder to come by, but they, they are out there, again, the same Russian sources. Uh, very, very low voltages. So, filament, inert gas, give it some electricity. Everyone knows a light bulb, I hope, to some degree. Uh, if you want to get really cool old light bulbs like this, they're called Edison bulbs. You can buy them anywhere. They're like five bucks. Lots of bars use them because they provide low hue and they look nice. Uh, okay. So, yeah, there's, uh, they're in sw small quantities all over eBay. Every time we see a hundred box set of them, we buy them. They, that's every couple months. Uh, they are, this is the ones that you can usually get. They're usually uh, seven segment, not really very useful beyond that, but they are, as you can see here, they're plugged into a shift register that's providing a little extra uh, current, but the same voltage as the digital I.O. And that's kind of the cool part about it. When you're using any sort of microcontroller and you plug into a LED, you need a resistor to limit the current flow or else it burns out. That's horrible. In this case, since you're just lighting up a filament, you don't need to limit the current flow. You can just plug it right in. Um, and that sounds crazy, but it works. Uh, this guy right here is actually plugged directly into a 3.3 volt mini Arduino. So the lowest possible voltage that you could have from an Arduino. Yo, shoot. Per segment. Uh, if you do decide to try and power one off of a microcontroller without a shift register with its own external power, you can do something kind of like uh, an array where you step through all the segments in a row and just keep refreshing. That works fine. PWM works fine on these as well. You can actually dim and make them brighter. PWM means pulse width modulation. It means you're pulsing the power in and modulating the distance between those pulses. So it's like, in this case, it would be three volts, three volts, three volts versus three volts, three volts, three volts, three volts. Pretty straightforward. Okay, this is the VFD. It's very different from the Nixie in a way, but also relies on similar principles. Um, this is actually considered a VFD Nixie because it looks like a Nixie, but it's, it's not. It's still a vacuum fluorescent display. Um, these are cool because they're, they were, these were considered very cheap back when LEDs weren't. So they made a variety of different displays that made use of this stuff, this technology. 
and they all look very good. The most notable one that you probably have seen or haven't seen that is very cool is uh, Lady Ada's Ice Tube Clock Kit. Very cool if you want to play with these very easily. Um, so these are three main components here. You got the cathode filament, a grid, and an anode phosphor layer. The phosphor layer is what's actually giving it the hue and actually providing the light in the end of it. What's basically happening is with um, the grid is actually acting as like a channel for an electron stream coming from the filament. I can't tell you too much more about these, how these operate. To be honest, they kind of bend my mind beyond a number of things. But from my understanding of it is it fires an electron chain down into a phosphorus layer, and the phosphorus layer reacts and generates light. Um, they are a little bit more complex. But VFDs are kind of great because they are everywhere. Uh, they are all around you in all the things that you use. eBay surplus is a wonderful place to find cool ones, but as you can see here, uh, they're available in all industry equipment. This is a point of sale device that you would see at any old cash register. Uh, they were used in vehicle displays and VCRs and stereo systems, and they are just everywhere. Uh, if you're lucky, they come with a controller board because these guys are incredibly hard to work with. Um, like I'm saying, VFDs are kind of a pain to drive because the way they were driven changed over the years. The older models required upwards of like 50 volts coming in on them on one level and then a lower voltage level on the other. The grid takes a different voltage level than the, the cathode layer, the, uh, this uh, filament. And that makes them kind of a bitch to drive. Uh, AC voltage is required on newer ones depending on the manufacturer. The older ones you can get away with using DC, but it's considered a bad thing to do. Um, this tutorial right here is actually done by Noritake, which actually makes VFDs. They go through everything that you could ever want to know about VFDs, and if you do want to actually work with them directly, they're the people to talk to. I would highly recommend that you work with, a, with your own display driver, though. Uh, find one, anything you use, get a display driver for it, because these are kind of a pain to work with. You're dealing with two different voltage levels, AC, interfacing with the digital circuit. At that point, you're doing all sorts of things that you probably don't want to. Um, I kind of ran out of ideas for slides at this point and just started doing some pretty pictures of things that we've done. Uh, I don't know if you guys can make this one out, but this is based off the Graffiti Research Lab's uh, laser graffiti system, which is kind of cool. Uh, the laser graffiti system actually uses a laser with a camera to spot the laser and then respond by basically unblacking areas of a projector on a surface. So you'll have a projector pointed here with a camera, point with the laser, it marks the laser on the camera and goes, okay, unblank here, turn it whatever the base default color is and drip it a little. Pretty good stuff, just pointing out that a projector is another optoelectronic source. There are two major types. Uh, there is the LCD, uh, uh, LCD liquid, ah, DSP projector, which are the digital lensing projectors, DLP, and then LED projectors, which I guess they're all LED at the end of it. But the digital lensing projectors use a chip with a million little lenses on them. And they're kind of pretty cool. But in terms of use of projectors, they're, use, they're not very useful during the day. They're only useful at night. They rely on a low contrast. Uh, this is uh, an LED array chip that they used to make a long time ago. Uh, HP makes a whole bunch of these as well. What it is is it's actually just a uh, five by seven array on chip, nothing else. Uh, HP also makes them now, but most of the ones nowadays actually have built-in drivers on them, so you're feeding them serial, so you just do it standard set of characters. These are great because you can actually start doing like mini animations on them. Kind of very cool. These are about five bucks a piece. I got them actually in Cleveland at uh, I think. Mentor Ohio's electronic surplus store, which I would suggest visiting if you're interested in electronics. Uh, this is the hand-built array that I did, one of them. Uh, basically demonstrating here that you can just embed them anywhere. This is literally right into a jacket with a driver chip embedded it above it. So, pretty cool. Uh, this is a Shure uh, LED numeric kit. Um, you can actually see the LEDs visible there. They're using a diffusion layer. Uh, if you are working with any light, diffusion is a wonderful way of getting shapes out of it and doing wonderful things. 
some of the VFD uh, Nixies actually rely on this. Instead of doing shapes that generate a number in phosphorus layer, they'll just generate phosphorus and have a template over it that diffuses it as a number and letter. Uh, what I don't have visible here is also some of the older LED technology would do like miniature LED arrays or miniature seven segments, and then use a bubble for diffusion like they would on a regular LED. That helps you send the, the light in the direction you want it to go. Okay. This is a demonstration of an ultraviolet LED. Uh, this is a low range ultraviolet, so it's not at all dangerous to look at, but uh, these can get very, very uh, bright. They're very little, but these guys can hurt your eyes if we push them up to their operating voltage. Uh, this is a MakerBot watch. Uh, a friend of ours designed it at MakerBot. Uh, he's actually put these out as a kit. The problem with this kit is it's a little more advanced. It relies on SMD soldering. Um, it's pretty cool. I have one here, actually, I can show you guys later. It, it sings all Lang Syne and counts down from 10. Tone. Uh, it's a little tone generator here and LEDs around the outside. Uh, SMD LEDs are very cool. As you can see, they get super, super small. You can embed a million of them on very small surfaces. Okay. This is uh, one of our members makes cakes uh, and puts components in them, including LEDs. This is one of the earlier ones. Uh, you want to be careful doing this. Obviously, you want to keep the cake away from the, uh, the LEDs because it has solder with like lead and mercury and silver and things that you don't want to ingest. Uh, sharp and pointy and you don't want to go there. So when you do do it, you, you keep it away from your food. But obviously we don't care. Uh, the LED cylinder is something that a friend of ours made and it's basically a, a variation on the LED cube, uh, which is a variation on the LED array in a way. Uh, this one was done using RGB which is kind of impressive. I would suggest uh, looking it up if you're, you're interested in it. This, the problem with this was it, it ends up breaking constantly. Um, the, the solder joints are joined onto standard wire and treating regular treated wire already with something else to try and make it capable of holding onto solder is difficult. Uh, we, we thought it was gonna be easier to just flux it and go. It was not that easy. Uh, this is using uh, Legos to diffuse LEDs. And uh, that's just demonstrating there's a lot of creativity you can have in light diffusion, uh, especially with clear guys like this. Uh, there's infrared lensing, there's polarized lensing, there's a million different ways of bending and flexing light and making it different once you have a light source. You don't always have to do it from the actual light source. Okay. So that's it for my slides. Uh, does anyone have any questions or something they'd like to hear about? Anyone? Anyone? Okay. Uh, there's a number of different ways. Most people just use um, PWM controllable uh, shift registers where you just fill it up, latch, fill it up again, latch. There are drivers where you can actually communicate in SPI or uh, I2C buses, which is serial. Uh, there are parallel uh, drivers. Uh, what I'm seeing now, I just bought some VFDs from uh, the internet from a company called Argus. Argus is a like grain manufacturing. Uh, they make grain control systems for major uh, farms, like industrial equipment. And they sell really great VFDs at something like a tenth of what they're worth because they don't realize what they're worth. And you buy them and you realize that they're just rebranded from another company, which I can't remember the name of right now. But those were all made in the early 1980s, back before serial was very used very much. People loved parallel back then. So some of the drives also use, uh, driver sets use parallel as well. Okay, any other questions, concerns? Anything I didn't answer? Shoot. And, uh, the defenestration of Prague. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, I, I don't follow that country's defenestrations. <laughs> it's a city? I don't know what it is. I'm an American. There's dragons over there. Okay. Shoot. Um, um, 
I, I can try, but I'm, I'm sorry, I don't know too much about it. My understanding of uh, the way lasers work is they line up frequency, so it's like all operating at the exact same moment. Um, okay, so we do have like a laser cutter that we work with, and we have some high-powered laser industrial equipment. Um, it's, lasers are dangerous, and they, they can get very dangerous very quickly. The problem is, is reflection. Um, if you are working with a laser, that's powerful enough to do damage. What you want to get is infrared, if it's a red laser, an infrared protective layer. Uh, most industrial equipment actually has treated panes of glass, which is why you can look in and see it do stuff. Get, get infrared protective eye, eye lining or something of that effect. Work outside the room. Shoot, what? I haven't, but Seth Hardy in the audience has. Um, they're kind of neat. They require a lot of power, and you usually have to buy the power supplies because they're very hard to build. But shoot. Similar? Yeah. Yeah, they're, they're high voltage. Yep. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Uh, I, I will tell you this. Uh, one of our members, uh, Diana Ang, has done a lot of clothing work with the EL wire. Uh, it can look very gaudy like it would on a regular burner, but if you diffuse it under layers of material, it can look very good. Uh, okay. <laughs> Shoot. Large amounts of AC bulbs? Um, Yeah, actually, what's interesting is I'm not, you may want to actually switch to older bulbs that have a lower power draw. The newer bulbs kind of draw as much as they can in some cases. Uh, the biggest problem you're going to run into there is that you start hitting like the upper limits of what's in your wall socket. The standard socket in a house is like 15 amps max, gets up to 17 and starts tripping breakers. So I'm not sure how many of those you can get in line. I have no idea, to be honest. Uh, multimeter it, see what the actual usage of it is. See, do the math, you know. Power equals. Oh, that's interesting, though. There are LEDs you can use for growing lamps. The uh, UV LEDs actually have been used successfully for growing plants. Shoot. Oh, uh, that's, that's, uh, that is, I don't know exactly how that system works. I know it uses the, uh, the Bug Labs motion detector. I'm not sure what they're using for motion detecting, but it could be a light sensor, probably. Yeah, the lights are on or off. Yeah, so I, I'm assuming the motion detector is a light sensor. And what it probably does is give you, there are LEDs that are like receiver LEDs. If you do like a infrared transmission, you can have one LED boom out in infrared, one receive the infrared. Um, those receiver LEDs can be used as motion detectors. They basically monitor shifts in brightness. That's all they can do. What is the gamma level in the room? Um, question related to this? Okay, so gamma detector sitting here. If you walk by, the shadow drops it marginally. If the lights are on, it's very bright. It has a very high numeric value for brightness and then has very low when the lights are off. So. Shoot. I honestly don't know. Uh, he might. What's up? <laughs> okay. So, any other questions? Okay. Uh, I would love to, except I don't know how to get the gas to stay in the light bulb. Yeah, yeah, I'll just weld it right in there. No, you have to. <laughs> yeah, you, know, you can do it with water, actually. Yeah, that's a good point. If you fill up the like paper with gas and feed it in, that's, that's one way of doing it. I haven't tried it. I would love to. Um, You don't have to put electricity in until you're done. 
Water is a conductor with salt in it, by the way, so if you want to use that. Uh, indeed. Actually, we, we, with the cake earlier, we were looking at uh, trying to generate uh, conductive strips that were edible, and very salty things can be used as conductors, but okay. High resistance. I haven't. Um, my understanding of fiber optics is they don't really light up except on the ends. So. Really? What is it leaking through if it's using like a laser on the other end? Is it leaking? What would happen if you put a laser in? <laughs> okay, no, no, that's very cool. I, I didn't realize it even existed. I will play with it. Okay. Anything else? Well, all you guys uh, privilege back here. Um, <laughs> I work a lot with um, consumer Christmas light string, LED strings, Ooh. LED specifically, because I just really like them. So, but I, um, I've been working with the Arduino controller on them and wanting to do a lot of um, computer sequence, well, program sequenced performance with them. But since they use AC with LEDs and there's almost never any rectification or Capacitance in them, it's it's pretty complicated. Have you ever uh, tried playing with those strings to see how they? We uh, we had an out? interesting situation that was a similar story, I guess. We kind of built our own string set by accident. Uh, one of our members, Adam, had a had bought an entire spool of LEDs from a factory, and instead of doing anything with them, since there were millions and millions of them, we decided to have some fun. We just started soldering one end to the next, one end to the next, one end to the next. I had this massive series of LEDs. And we got it to the point where it was just big enough that if we plugged it directly into wall current, they wouldn't burn out. <laughs> so the problem there is if you touch it, it's going to, you're touching a wall current. But, uh, but yeah, no, no, I, it, yeah. You know, at the other end, you'd be fine. Uh, you have bled off most of the energy. Um, but it, it, it's, it's program. Doing programmable work with AC is kind of a pain. You might as well switch it over to DC power source. I, I don't see what you would yeah, use there. Yeah, so what I wonder is, um, if you were to rectify the AC to DC, would you have to use a lower voltage? I mean, um, well, Most of these strings seem to be just wired exactly out actually, as you built your string, just pure series, well, no here, resistance. Here's a, here's a really easy way to cheat. Uh, mm -hmm. You get a variac, and you, you put a servo next to it, and you just control the variac mechanically. <laughs> 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 that's, that's one way of doing it. Uh, switching it over to DC, you're going to be dealing with a high voltage DC supply, and at that point where you're talking about switching modes inside of a DC power supply, doing that efficiently is generally expensive. I know you can buy DC switching mode power supplies that are programmable, but they're also very expensive. Um, it's, it's a cost of components at that level or, doing, or engineering it yourself. I don't know exactly how you want to go about doing that. Uh, it's, it, I guess it would be hard on a long strand to control high voltage on it. Right, each channel would have its own circuitry to do that. No, no worries. Yeah, yeah, I, I, yeah. You could use a light dimmer, yeah. That's actually a good idea. That's AC line voltage. You could mechanically control it a dimmer. That's, that's not a bad idea. Not very quick, but... Uh, well, it's, <laughs> it's doable. And there are wireless light dimmers out there. Um, I'm sure if, we, if you can track down Travis Goodspeed, he probably knows a couple ways to get into them. Uh, yeah. Actually, along those lines, there's a lot of MacGyver stuff you can do with uh, components. Like, uh, this is my favorite one. The uh, thermostat in the house has, a, has temperature sensitive metals on it, so it can be used to open and close circuits based on whether or not it's unfurled itself or not unfurled itself. And that's done entirely mechanical based on the temperature and the effect on the metal. So there's a lot of cool little household things that work like that. It's kind of cool. I love it. I'm not going to lie. Uh, <laughs> so for anyone who doesn't know, the Bedazzler is an interesting device. They're using light as a weapon. Uh, it, it's kind of like a blast of a whole bunch of high frequency, very bright LEDs. 
that are designed to make you feel sick. It's kind of like uh, the brain machine upstairs that, uh, that Mitch has, only designed to hurt you. So it's, there, it's, that's actually kind of cool. Uh, if you do go upstairs, check out the brain machine. Uh, it actually uses pulse modulation of the, uh, of the LED to actually generate or change your brainwave states, which is kind of crazy to me. But uh, yeah, light, light is perceived by us and goes straight to our brain. And then we try and take it apart. But like any system, you throw it, some, throw it a curveball, it sometimes breaks in interesting ways. So, uh, Actually, we do know that sunlight actually affects people and makes them happier and more productive. Uh, when possible, you may want to actually try to mimic sunlight. I know they, they make growing lamps, actually kind of very expensive growing lamps that can kind of mimic sunlight. Uh, there's probably stuff people could do there where they push light that has a better effect on people. Okay. Any questions at all? That's a good question. Take a drink. No, what, what happens with the defenestration of the frog? Really? Why? Mm -mm. What does defenestration mean? Anyone? Oh, why would you do that? <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, I'm done. Have a good one. Uh, it's been a pleasure. Uh,